All right, our next presenter this afternoon is Angelina Torres, who comes to us from Caltech, where she'll be a sophomore this coming fall. Um, she's been working this summer with Josh, and um, she's going to tell us today about her project, Another One Blow by Dust, Mapping the Spatial Extent of Clouds Surrounding Tabby Star. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really excited to talk to you all about my research today, but first, I need to give you a little bit of context about this crazy little thing called Tabby Star. Now, back in 2016, the Kepler telescope discovered a star in the Cygnus constellation, which showed aperiodic dips and flux that were inconsistent in depth and inconsistent in length. Here we have a plot of the original data that was taken by the, by the Kepler telescope of this star. On the x-axis, we have the total observation time, about 1,600 days. And on the y-axis, we have the normalized flux of the star. Labeled in blue are 10 discrete dips, which really visualize this irregular behavior. Notice that these dips range from about 0.2% of the star's overall flux to going straight off the plot. These peak at 22% of the star's overall flux. However, by all means, Tabby's star is a completely regular F3V main sequence star. There are no signs of anything like youth or infrared excess that might explain this behavior. In short, of 150,000 stars that were discovered by the Kepler telescope, this is the only one whose behavior could not be explained in terms of stellar astrophysics. So naturally, the scientific community goes wild. Is this star devouring another planet? Is it a triple star system? It might be aliens. It could be a comet swarm, but it might be aliens. Are we going to talk about any of these theories that I just listed? No, we are going to talk about something slightly less interesting, but I hold dear to my heart. One, the theory that a cloud of gas and dust is passing through the line of sight of our instruments and Tabby's star, causing this irregular dimming. And two, the goal of my research. We're going to be mapping the spatial extent of this dust. That is, we want to determine if this dust is local to Tabby's star or if it's passing through the interstellar medium. Now, this begs the question, Angelina, how do we determine the spatial extent of a cloud that's passing through space? I'm so glad you asked. We have a four-step method to making this possible. Now on the left here, we have an image taken by the digitized sky survey. In the center, we have Tabby's star. Tabby's star is surrounded by five nearby bright stars. Using the Gemini North telescope, we've collected spectra of all six of these stars. We can reduce these spectra into a form of wavelength versus normalized flux and focus on elements that are characteristic to the clouds passing in front of the stars. No, we're not focusing on Mercury. Go away, Freddie. We're going to be focusing on sodium-1, which is characteristic to these clouds. We can fit models to the data that we've plotted and collect the observed rest wavelengths of sodium-1 in all of these clouds. From these observed wavelengths and the known rest wavelengths of sodium-1, we can use the Doppler equation to calculate the velocities of all of these clouds. From these velocities, we can draw our conclusions. If the velocities in front of all of the in front of all the stars are different, we can likely conclude that the that the cloud in front of Tabby's star is local to the star. However, if the velocities of multiple clouds are similar to the velocity we see in front of Tabby's star, then we can likely conclude that this cloud is passing through the interstellar medium. Now that was a lot rather fast, so I'm going to break this down even further. We start out with some good old fashioned data reduction. The Gemini North Telescope has an instrument known as GRACES. GRACES collects a shell spectrograph. The shell spectrographs, or GRACES collects a shell spectra. A shell spectra are two dimensional in terms of wavelength. They move from bluer to redder on both the X and the Y axis. Here we have an example of a shell spectrum. Note that we see all of these white bars. These are known as a shell orders. They're chunks of wavelengths that we can observe. They're spaced apart for easier visualization. Now, a shell spectra are great for collecting precise data. However, they're a little bit hard to analyze. And there are two reasons for this mainly. One, notice that each of these shell orders are split into two different themes. This is because the Espadon's spectrograph, which collects this data, has two optical fibers. It's collecting two beams of light representative of one object. 
Second of all, notice that in between our shell orders, we have these little white dots. These are representative of stellar and atmospheric patterns that are caused by our, our Earth and the stars that we're looking at. We don't really want to observe these when we're looking for our sodium absorption. So we can use a program called OPERA to reduce these spectra, combining the two beams of light, removing the patterns that we don't want to look at, and creating a plot in the form of one-dimensional wavelength versus normalized flux. That looks a little bit like this. This is a one-dimensional spectra for Tabby's star. And note, again, we want to be looking for sodium-1 absorption features. Those are in wavelengths 588 to 590 nanometers. And we're seeing those. We have two key absorption features here on this plot. And each of them has a characteristic blue shift on double peak on these features. Now we can clean this graph up a little bit. It's a little messy right now by focusing more on the pixels that are closer to the absorption features we want to be observing. We can also create a model, which will look a bit like this and will capture those characteristic peaks. Now, if we look at this compared to the known rest wavelength of sodium one in this blue line, we can notice that the red peaks are slightly to the left of this known rest wavelength. This is good. We can collect these two wavelengths at these peaks and we can compare them to the known rest wavelength. We return to our good old friend, the Doppler effect. We plug in our known wavelengths, our observed wavelengths, and we get characteristic velocities for this cloud passing in front of Tabby's star. These velocities are minus 22.4 kilometers a second, minus 8.26 kilometers a second. Excellent. Now we have five other stars. So we can begin to draw preliminary conclusions about these stars and whether or not they share the gas cloud in front of Tabby's star by looking at the locations of these observed wavelengths for any notable absorption features. So let's do that. We're gonna start with star 8462798, circled here in green. These red lines are the observed wavelengths that we've collected from Tabby's star. Now note, we do have an absorption feature that is in the ballpark of these red lines. However, this is only a singular absorption feature. It doesn't have that characteristic blue peak. If we look closely, you might say, oh, well, what about this double peak here? Doesn't this count as a double peak picture similar to what we saw in Tabby's star? Well, no. If we notice in the rest of this graph, we have a relatively low signal to noise in comparison to Tabby's star. In fact, for all of these stars, we're going to have a relatively low signal to noise ratio compared to Tabby's star. So this double peak feature can't really be accredited to a true double peak absorption feature. It can only be really thought of as signal to noise. Next, we're gonna look at 2836. 2836 does have that blue shifted peak. However, it is a lot wider spaced in comparison to what we saw with Tabby's star. So we're going to want to create a model to see what that wavelength is at the blue peak and what the difference is in velocity between the wave between the velocity we measured at the blue peak in Tabby star and the velocity that we're measuring here. Next, we're looking at 2860. It's the same thing as 2798. We have a singular absorption feature in the ballpark of these observed wavelengths, but we're not seeing that double peak that's characteristic to the cloud floating in front of Tabby star. Now we're going to look at 2889, which I find particularly exciting because it has the double peak feature. This split in the center is too large for us to really credit it towards signal to noise. So we know this is a double peak that we can plot. And these peaks are in the same wavelength ballpark as the observed peaks from Tabby's star. This is exciting. I'm definitely going to want to create a model so I can get those precise peak numbers and compare these velocities. They're likely to be very close to what we see in Tabby's star. And finally, we're gonna look at 2897. Same thing again, it's got a double peak feature in, these, in the range of these observed wavelengths. We're definitely going to want to create a model so that we can draw these comparisons. So now we've looked at Tabby star, and we've looked at the other five stars. What conclusions can we draw from all of these plots? Well, I have three for you today. One, we have approximate velocities for the cloud that's in front of Tabby star. These characteristic velocities are about minus 8.263 kilometers a second, minus 22.442 kilometers a second. 
this is great news. It means that we're a step closer to being able to discover whether these clouds are floating in front of a star, local to the star, or passing through the interstellar medium. This is a great step. Second, we have a lot of really strong candidates for stars that are potentially sharing this cloud with Tabby's star. If we looked at these spots and we didn't see these strong absorption features in sodium, we might be able to automatically draw the conclusion that this cloud is local to Tabby's star. However, we are seeing characteristics in these clouds flowing about the other stars that are similar to what we're seeing around Tabby's star, which means we still officially have no idea what's going on. Until we can create these models and draw the conclusions that we need uh, and get these velocities really, we can't officially say whether we know if this cloud is in the interstellar medium or local to Tabby's star. And so our science must go on. First order of business, obviously being, I need to create these accurate fits for all of these stars so I can get these velocities and begin to look at these conclusions. The second order of business is a bit of a check. It is possible that these velocities that we're observing in the sodium one regions are due to the velocity of the star through space. And so we can check to make sure that this isn't the case by repeating the modeling process for the H alpha regions of each star. We calculate the velocities there and we can compare them to the velocities that we're calculating in the sodium one regions. If they're about similar, we might be able to credit the velocities we're observing at sodium one, not to a dust cloud, but rather to the velocity of the star through space. Finally, the plots that you've seen today were all generated from a singular spectrum from each star. We can get a general, more comprehensive view of the behaviors we're observing in each star by combining multiple spectra that we have access to and creating a model from that. I'd like to thank Gwen Rudy for making this CASI program possible, my wonderful mentor, Josh Simon, for helping me along every step of the way, all my fellow interns for making the past 10 weeks a blast, and you for listening to my talk today. So thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm willing to answer them now. All right, very nice job, Angelina. It looks like Fari has a question. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Hi, Angelina. Thank you very much. Really fascinating stuff. I have um, two very quick questions. One is, I was wondering whether um, you, you did or plan to look at some other spectral lines to kind of um, confirm these absorption features, like you saw sodium D. I was wondering whether your spectra um, also covered things like, I don't know, magnesium one, perhaps, uh, for 5175. That's something that Normally, when you see something in sodium B, you will also see a corresponding line in uh, magnesium 1B. Um, so that's my first question. My second question is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like you saw that double component uh, blue shifted feature in at least one other star. And I was wondering whether you knew what the, uh, whether you have like distance estimates either from Gaia or something, I don't know how far those two stars are apart in projection, that star from Tabby star, and whether you could kind of use that to kind of bracket like, you know, some sort of a limit on the, the, um, the size of this um, structure that is occulting um, the Tabby star, this, this cloud, this cloud of gas and dust. Thank you. Yeah, so to answer your first question, the spectra that we've collected for each of the stars do cover a wide range of wavelengths, about 400 nanometers to 1,000 nanometers. So we can definitely look for other elements and see if we notice these patterns as another check if we wanted to. It's not something that we currently have in the plans, but it's definitely something that I could look into. Uh, to answer your second question, we do have data from the Gaia telescope about the distances of these stars from us. I don't know those numbers off the top of my head, but I can definitely look into that data that was collected by the Gaia telescope to see if I can put some kind of limit on those distances. Thank you. All right, wonderful. I think we need to move on, but um, thank you, Angelina, for that presentation.